This is China's Lus Plateau. Until recently, this was one of the poorest regions in the country, a land renowned for floods, mudslides, and famine. But with the fanfare comes the hope of change for the better. My name is John D. Liu. I've been documenting the changes on the plateau for 15 years. I first came here in 1995 to film an ambitious project where local people were constructing a new landscape on a vast scale. With the aim of transforming a barren land, into a green and fertile one. The project certainly changed my life, convincing me to become a soil scientist. The lessons I've learned in the last few years have made me realize that many of the human tragedies that we regularly witness around the world, the floods, mudslides, droughts, and famines, are not inevitable. Here on the Lus Plateau, I've witnessed that people can lift themselves out of poverty. They can radically improve their environment, and by doing so, reduce the threat of climate change. When I first came to the Lus Plateau, I was astounded by the degree of poverty and degradation. And I wondered, how could the Chinese people, the largest ethnic group on the planet, and my father's and my own ancestors, come from a place that was this barren? China's Lus Plateau is a region that stretches for 640,000 square kilometers across north-central China. Unspoilt valleys in neighboring Sichuan show us how it might once have looked. It's the sort of natural abundance that is necessary to support an emerging civilization. How could a landscape with such potential have been reduced to this? When Chinese scientists and civil engineers began to survey the area, they realized that several thousand years of agricultural exploitation had denuded the hills and valleys of vegetation. The relentless grazing of domestic animals on the slopes meant that there was no chance for young trees and shrubs to grow. The rainfall no longer seeped into the earth, but simply washed down the hillsides taking the soil with it. Over millennia, this progressively destroyed the region's fertility. This process has been repeated on every continent. One thing that became apparent early on is the connection between damaged environments and human poverty. In many parts of the world, there's been a vicious cycle. Continuous use of the land has led to subsistence agriculture, and generation by generation, this has further degraded the soils. The vital question we have to ask is, can this destructive process be reversed? <laughs> Fifteen years ago, Chinese and international experts were confident it could be. They decided that to prevent further erosion, it was necessary to cease farming on certain key areas to allow the trees and shrubs to grow back. But this could not happen without the consent of the farmers themselves. They took some persuading. Of course, a lot of people didn't understand the project. They weren't thinking in the long term. They want us to plant trees everywhere. Even in the good land. 
What about the next generation? They can't eat trees. What eventually convinced the local people was the assurance that they would have tenure of their land, that they would directly benefit from the effort they invested in the new project. The goal was to give a hat to the hilltops, give a belt to the hills as well as shoes at the base. The hat meant that the top of these hills had to be replanted with trees. The belt meant that terraces had to be built to be used for crop planting and also for trees. The shoes were the dams which we had to build so that the hills could grow back to life and our economy as well as our lives could improve. One vital change was in the local laws. Hills and gullies were designated as ecological zones to be protected. Farmers were given financial compensation for not farming on them and keeping their livestock pinned up. When I first filmed Mr. Ta Fu Yuan and his colleagues back in 1995, I had no idea that this initiative could achieve such dramatic results. The effort that people put into converting their slopes into terraces has resulted in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. The changes are not simply on the hillsides. On the plains you can see greenhouses that are filled with vegetables. This extends the growing season. It's very high value produce. The abundance and variety of new produce can be seen in the markets. Follow-up studies show that local people's incomes have risen threefold. The increased productivity of the fields is directly related to the return of natural vegetation in the surrounding ecological land. Now, when it rains, the water no longer runs straight off the slopes. Trapped by the vegetation, it sinks into the ground, where it is retained in the soil, taking weeks and months to gently seep down and irrigate the fields and terraces below. The transformation you see in this valley has been replicated over an area of more than 35,000 square kilometers. The impact of such a huge change in vegetation goes far beyond the plateau itself. There's been a marked reduction in the soil rushing down into the Yellow River. But there are also global benefits. When I look back at the old images of degraded landscapes, I now realize how many natural processes were disrupted. Restoring plant life on such a large scale helps change our atmosphere. Plants through photosynthesis remove carbon from the atmosphere, helping to counter the effect of human greenhouse gas emissions on the climate. In terms of climate change, we can say that the project made a double contribution. Firstly, the project was successful in restoring vegetation on a large scale. So many trees and so much vegetation grew up, and this definitely helped take carbon out of the atmosphere. Secondly, because the health of the Loos Plateau's ecosystem has been so much improved, the region will be better able to resist the negative impacts of climate change.
As a result of its success, the lessons learned from the Lus Plateau rehabilitation are now being applied all over China. But could such projects work elsewhere in less centrally controlled societies with fewer resources and different soils? Ethiopia, perhaps more than any other country, has come to symbolize the vulnerability of humankind to environmental catastrophe. This is a country whose problems have been increased by war and civil conflict. And now, human-induced climate change is likely to make matters worse. Here also, centuries of subsistence farming practices have stripped the land of natural vegetation. The dry gullies bear the scars of flash floods. These gullies are evidence of the enormous power of runoff during the rainy season. Without vegetation cover on the hillsides, when the rains come, the water doesn't soak into the ground but flows away in a flood. Then it's not available for agriculture during the rest of the year. This leads to drought, and famously for Ethiopia, famine. It was the BBC News reports in 1984 from the province of Tigray that first drew the world's attention to the disastrous famine there when hundreds of thousands died. Prolonged drought and a negligent government were blamed for the human tragedy that unfolded. But just as I've witnessed in China, there is hope that the situation here can be reversed. In just six years, Professor Lagessa Nagash and local villagers have transformed a severely eroded terrain by planting indigenous trees and plants. Almost miraculously, a clear flowing stream has emerged where once there was a muddy trickle. How is it that it's possible for you to get the stream to flow throughout the year? It is because of the vegetation cover, which has been regenerating on this mountain. This water is maintained in the landscape because as soon as rain falls on the canopy on this vegetation, that rain then infiltrated gradually into the ground, ending up with this steady flow of this river. Water is life. Without water, nobody can do anything. About a thousand kilometers further north, in the village of Abraha Aspaha, another near miraculous phenomenon is occurring. Farmers are finding water at the bottom of their wells, despite the poor rains this year. The famine of 1984 struck the people of this valley very hard. Many migrated, many died. Now the people are returning. The village chairman, Gabra Gede, remembers well how life used to be. Ten years ago, I'd say, even five years ago, I'll tell you what the situation was. It was absolutely terrible. The sun, the drought, the wind, it was all dry like the desert. There was a refugee program for our village, so we had a choice, leave the valley or do something. With government support, they applied the same principles as the Chinese, setting land aside for natural vegetation to return. In the ravines, they built small dams, which are now fed by underground springs and like Professor Legessa's stream, rain that fell weeks ago now slowly seeps through the subsoil, replenishing the supply of water. The eroded land has become fertile. It's changed for the better. In the drought, our fruit trees dried up. Now they're coming back, and we're growing even more varieties. These are the real benefits we've seen. We have food security, and our children can go to school. 
our lives have improved. We no longer need to beg the government for aid, thanks to the changes that we've made. Even wild animals which disappeared are returning, even the leopards. These villagers can now better withstand the impact of climate change. With international assistance, their achievement could be repeated across the country, and the benefits would spread far beyond Ethiopia's borders. Half of Ethiopia is mountain, and this mountain system is degraded. And this degradation of this huge landscape, huge mountain chain of Ethiopia, is critical not only for Ethiopia, but also for the entire region. Consider Egypt. Look at the Sudan, where 86% of the Nile flows to these countries. How can we support life in Egypt without restoring Ethiopia's mountains? So this is regional, national, and international. Environmental degradation is not only a problem for the dry regions of Ethiopia. It can be just as devastating for countries like Rwanda, where rainfall is plentiful. This tiny country is grappling with the problem of a growing population trying to eke out a living on a finite amount of land. As in China and Ethiopia, over-farming on the hillsides caused serious erosion and a decline in fertility, forcing poor farmers to move into protected areas, such as the Rugezi wetlands, a wildlife site of international importance. When farmers drain this marsh to try to grow more food, they not only damaged an important wetland ecosystem, they also had a significant impact three hours drive away in Kigali, the capital city. The water that pours from the marshlands is a vital source of hydropower for Rwanda's capital. As the wetlands began to dry out, power stations below couldn't generate enough electricity. The Rwandan government rented diesel power generators to make up the shortfall. Dr. Rose Mukan Komeji took me to see them. So what is happening here is that those generators, we are renting them from this company, and we have been obliged to rent them, especially when we degraded the wetland, and we lost 20 megawatts of uh, electricity. And to run those machines, we're paying 65,000 US dollars a day. $65,000 a day, that's multi-millions of dollars yes, per year. You, it is multi-million dollar, and as you must, might know, Rwanda is not a rich country. Some of that money has been borrowed from the bank, is from taxpayers. How does this affect the climate? Of course, those machines, they are run under uh, uh, diesel, and when you burn diesel, you are producing greenhouse gases. environmentally damaging and more expensive. Locals had to pay three times as much for their electricity. So government policymakers focused on how to restore the Rugezi wetlands. If people were the problem, they could also be the solution. We had to take a careful look at what had actually been happening that damaged uh, this uh, system and therefore had to reverse that again with the human action uh, and this is why it is important to look at how human actions can destroy or can reverse what has been destroyed or even protect uh, our environment. The government decided to help the farmers leave the wetlands and to restore the degraded slopes above them, improving their croplands and encouraging trees and shrubs to grow back, capturing the rain. We have been supporting them by uh, doing terraces, specifically there on the hills, where they can increase and improve the productivity. The most important thing is to have people with you on your side. Mm. 
The Rugezi wetlands are now recovering. Great volumes of water once again cascade down to power the hydro stations. Carbon-free electricity is replacing the diesel generators. Electricity prices have stabilized. What the Rwandans recognized is that the marshlands are far more valuable as a natural system providing water for energy than as farmland. This principle is the same for the remaining hillsides and ravines. What we're seeing here is very interesting because it's, it's a line between human activity and natural systems. And in the human activity, we've been able to value the, the productivity from agriculture and give it a, a, a monetary value. But in the natural systems, we haven't been able to value the trees, the biodiversity, the water that's absorbed into the biomass and into the soils. And there's another vital service that trees and plants provide, photosynthesis. Vegetation reduces the greenhouse effect by taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Climate change is better withstood with trees. You know, humans, no matter how in intelligent we are, no matter how capable we are with all our technologies, we are helpless in the face of climate change. We have not yet properly understood the miracles performed by trees. Restoring and preserving natural ecosystems like the Rugezi wetlands benefits everyone. And so much more could be achieved. If we had more involvement by different institutions coming in to help with their available resources, Rwanda could do more, much more, and benefit much more, but so would other countries if such a partnerships and support were provided. A measure of what can be achieved has been shown here on China's Lus Plateau, where restoring the natural vegetation has helped the farmers to prosper despite the worst drought in decades. Over 15 years, the soil that nurtures their crops has been accumulating organic material from plants and animals. This holds the moisture and contains carbon. What's interesting about this is all these root materials, all this other stuff, this is organic material. And this organic material is mixing together with the lus, the geologic soils here, and it's making a living soil. This is where the moisture resides. Yesterday it rained and there's still moisture in the soil. This is where the nutrients are recycled so that each generation of life emerges here. And this is where the carbon is. What's interesting about this, they made this field. This is new. So they're helping to sequester carbon. Living soils like this retain on average three times more carbon than the foliage above the ground. All this new vegetation naturally absorbs carbon through photosynthesis. If, as scientists suggest, a quarter of the Earth's land mass has been degraded, imagine what effect restoring those regions would have on reducing human impact on climate change. What we've seen in China, in Africa, and around the world is that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems. If we can transfer the capital, the technology, and empower the local people to restore their own environment, it'll have enormous benefits. Restoration can sequester carbon, reduce biodiversity loss, mitigate against flooding, drought, and famine. It can ensure food security for people who are now chronically hungry. Why don't we do this on a global scale?